What I'm going to speak about uh, in my 30 minutes is really to talk to you a little bit about the history of the Intelligent Community Project, to talk to you about the relationship between technology and humanity as we view it, and then to give you a, a little snapshot or a picture of where intelligent communities are in 2022, what we think the intelligent community has evolved into so that you can look at it and measure it against the development here in Bindung. So that's my intention today. And as I always like to say, smart city is about more than technology and evidently my friends agree with me because they've been talking about it uh, all morning and I'm very pleased to hear that. Let me tell you a little bit about my organization, ICF. I'm, I'm one of the founders. I'm one of the people who um, formed the ICF. My, uh, my belief was that any city, any town, any region, any place on earth that you or someone else calls home should be a good quality place to live. And we believe that is true. And we wanted to find a simple method so that every city in the world could share equally in this concept and in this economic and social reality. We are privately funded, a privately funded research organization that helps cities understand how to grow using that method. So we don't, um, we don't take money from government. Uh, we take money out of our own pocket uh, to make sure that uh, ICF uh, can do exactly what it wants to do. ICF, uh, I'm pleased to say, thanks to cities like yours, has achieved international recognition. And we are known around the world uh, for our work. And we've been invited to many prestigious uh, events around the world. We seek harmony between technology and human intelligence for national, social, and economic growth, which is what we've been talking about today. And as I said, we promote the idea that there is no place like home and that any home can be good. Let me tell you a little bit about the history. There we were when we were young. Um, this young man became an opera singer. I don't know if, um, <laughs> I don't know if the interpreter even got that, but uh, at the very beginning of ICF, we had several ideas that we were working with. The most important idea at that time, about 20 years ago, was that broadband was new, but that its potential was enormous. And as Peter said earlier today, nobody really knew much about broadband. I knew a little bit about it because I had a business in the satellite industry. We knew that satellites provided ample broadband across the world, but we wanted to understand the relationship between broadband, telecommunications, real estate, and economic development in cities. We thought that they could connect with one another if we brought together the right people to think about this idea. We also noticed that the workforce around the world, again, as you've described here, the media, the way we take in information, and the way work was being done was changing very quickly. And so we looked at that factor and we said, there, if we don't move quickly with our cities, if we don't start to put new ideas together for cities, we are going to have some real problems with our workers. We are going to have problems managing this new media, social media and everything else. So we looked at that factor. We also realized that something was happening in the rural areas and small villages, uh, whether it is, it is here or China, or North Dakota in the United States or Canada, people were leaving small agricultural villages, leaving behind their parents, their history, their cultures and moving to the big cities. But what was happening was that those small villages were dying. They were having a lot of problems. We also noticed that mid-sized industrial cities that had manufactured things that had made steel or whatever it was, we're also beginning to lose economic ground 
because work was changing. Jobs were going to different places. And again, the workforce was no longer required to work the way it did. Robots were taking over and we saw different types of um, productivity coming into these places that was disrupting everything. So we felt that there was a need to uh, reindustrialize and find new methods, new ways to design our city. And so, oh, the other thing we found was that local governments, local governments, mayors, city councilors, the provincial leaders, they were becoming very innovative because the national governments were, were really having a difficult time managing the situation. And so the local leaders began to innovate. And we found that to be very dynamic, very good for cities in the long term. So these were the, these were the factors 15 and 20 years ago. That chart I have up there um, is newspaper advertising revenue from 1950 to 2012. And you can tell what media, new media has done. Newspaper revenues, advertising revenues just completely dropped. So again, that was a sign. That's like a doctor taking your blood pressure and saying, you have no pulse. Something's wrong here. So we looked at those factors. And what we did, and I won't give you all the details, we began to, uh, work with New York University and others, the founders of the BlackBerry, the, the famous communications device. And we looked at cities around the world that were working well, that, be, that were doing what been doing is doing today, that were way ahead of their time. And we said, why, why are they succeeding? And why are other places not succeeding? And can you give me a simple method for helping these cities, for helping any city understand how to, how to grow, how to be like an airplane. You know, an airplane will take off and it will continue to ascend. It will get to a certain level, then it will accelerate. We, we wanted a very simple method that we could bring to cities and teach them how to do this. And this is what we came up with at the time. And they, it's famously now called the Intelligent Community Indicators. And it is, it is our philosophy, it is, it is our method for working. And as you can see, broadband was very important. The workforce was important. Innovation was important. Equality, digital equality, giving everybody access to the same information was very important. Sustainability was important. And we, had, we called it advocacy at the time. What advocacy means is communication. Are you communicating with the people in your city? Are you communicating with each other about how to make a better world? The cities that were doing this were having success. Now, if you fast forward it today, 200 cities have followed this method and have become intelligent communities. Hundreds of others are working with our method. They haven't been designated yet. They're not quite good enough yet to be called intelligent communities. But today these cities are realizing the possibilities. Let's take a look at the farm. You see that tractor, it looks like an average tractor. But that tractor is run by a satellite. That tractor is able to look at a field and know just what seed goes where, to know what the water levels are, and to measure a lot of data all at one time because it is connected to a satellite. It's, it is using technology, but it is really not complicated. It's a very simple process. As I said, it's guided by a satellite. And um, my niece drew the satellite for you. Um, what's important there is that you can do things as a, as a startup company to continue to push forward agriculture, for example. There's a company in Winnipeg, Canada called Farmer's Edge. And what they've done is to disrupt the financial model of farming. In the old days, when a farmer, whether he's in India, Canada, Bangladesh, Vietnam, would go to get insurance for his crops, the insurance companies would tell him 
where they would tell him how much he needed to pay. But because this gentleman created this business that uses data from the satellites, the farmers now have the information before the insurance companies. They know what the risks are for their fields. They know how much crop they need to buy, not too much, and not get oversold, not pay too much. And so now the farmers have the advantage and they've been able to make more money. They've been more efficient. So when I talk about more than technology, this is what I mean. Farming has been reinvented. Farming is new now. Farming is a new technology industry in many parts of the world. So that's what's happening today. It is very different today. Everybody knows what broadband is, but today we have high-speed integrated networks fully integrated into the ecosystem. The people from Ohio told you what they were doing with their networks. They connect it to the businesses, they connect it to their universities, they connect it to their supercomputer, they connect it to their research laboratories. And what they've been able to do is to create an ecosystem where the entire city becomes a laboratory. So companies will go there and say, can I try my new technology out in your city? And they'll say, sure, come on in. We have the capabilities. But if you come and you like it here, you have to locate your office. You have to invest. So that's the advantage of having the technology. No, I don't want to change. And of course, again, the discussion today is about 5G, AI, cloud center infrastructure, which is very important, and what we call LEOs. Those are low earth orbit satellites that are being put up by Elon Musk and dozens of other companies that are helping those tractors become intelligent tractors. They provide the tools that we need now to manage our cities, to have more data about our economies, so that again, we can plan the next evolution of a bindong more carefully with more reliable data. And it really helps our economic strength, our economic muscle. Because today, size doesn't matter in a city. A place like Bindong, I think it's 2.6 million people, can have the same performance as a city of 10 million people because it uses these tools. That city you heard from this morning, Dublin, Ohio, you know how many people they have? 50,000, that's all. But you know what they've done? They've been able to bring in more Fortune 1000 companies on a per capita basis than any other city in the United States more than New York, more than Los Angeles. So size doesn't matter anymore because technology is the tool to advance the city. And there is a new digital economy. That's the economy we're in now. And so that's why I talked earlier about knowledge work being so important and using the digital infrastructure. It unlocks the most important thing in the world, human creativity. There is nothing more important at the end of the day, what do we remember? We don't always remember the economic performance of the ancient Persians or the Ming dynasty. We don't remember the economists from those times, but we remember the artists. We remember the creative people. We remember the people who started new companies and new ideas. Creativity is what is going to make humanity more peaceful, more prosperous. Entrepreneurship is going to lead to the types of things we want. And I'm hoping that by working with cities, that city diplomacy, as my friend uh, said earlier this morning, is going to create a more peaceful and harmonious world. Cities do not go to war against each other. Cities become friends with each other. Cities have a common interest. When you come, if you come to Canada or the United States, or you go to Brazil or Moscow or any place, you're going to have the same conversation. It's not gonna be a political conversation. It's gonna be a conversation about how you run your city better how you pick up your garbage better. Those are the most important conversations in the world. So ICF studies and will continue to study the balance between technology and the human mind. We're now looking at human psychology. We're looking at neuroscience. 
We're looking at things that improve people's mental health so that they can, again, live happier lives. These are, these are very important issues that we're gonna be looking, that we're looking into. Our model is still six things, but we've changed a little bit. Now, instead of broadband, we talk about connect. And as we heard earlier today, connect is not just connecting with your telecommunications, right? Your phone, but it's also connecting with your ecosystem, connecting with each other, right? Making human connections using the technology. Sustain, include, right? If, if we include everybody, on every ride, it'll be a crowded bus, but it'll be a happier bus. We'll have more human potential available to us if everybody is trained, if everybody is educated, if everybody is as enthusiastic about their cities as everyone else. And you can see the rest of those. And I think you understand them very well now. Uh, just one final thing on technology. Again, it's, you can use it in ways that you can only imagine. In New York, we've got a company that we work with. The name of the company is called Launch. And they build rockets, right? They build rockets. But you know how they build them? Using additive materials and 3D printers. And they're sending these things up into space successfully. So again, uh, your ideas are the only thing that limit you if you don't have them. Uh, my, last, my last series of remarks, um, how are we doing on time, Lynn? Good. My last series of remarks is to tell you, this is for the leadership. These are for, this is for the leaders. We've observed that intelligent community, by and large, are led very well, led by very, very talented and good people of all different kinds, but they're usually people who have three, three characteristics. This is again, my observation of the leaderships that I've observed. It's true here and it's true in all of the other places. By the way, this statue is a golfer named Jack Nicklaus. And um, there's a golf course in Dublin, Ohio, who you heard from this morning that he designed. It's one of the best uh, golf courses in the world. So if you go to Ohio in October, where we're going to probably have our summit, uh, you can visit that, that statue. <laughs> um, and everybody's nodding their head, you must, you must golf. But he's instructing a young man. The, num the number one thing I learned, um, intelligent communities and their leaders don't resist change. They're, they're not afraid of change, right? They, uh, they know they can't do anything about the weather, so they don't try to change it. But they know what to resist and what not to resist. But when change comes, they don't go backwards, they go forward. They're like an airplane. An airplane has no reverse gear. It can only go forward. And um, I think that's an ancient truth here in Vietnam, that if you continue to do the same thing, if you cling to something, an old idea, a notion of reality that is changing, you'll suffer. So change, change, change. You don't need to change the look, you don't need to change social stability, but you need to change your ideas to keep, to keep moving forward. And I see leaders who are not afraid to change. One good example I think is Eindhoven, the Brainport uh, group there. And Peter and Joost will, will tell you more about this. I think they're one of the best examples in the world about not resisting change. The uh, second thing I've, I've observed is that intelligent communities they communicate very well. Everybody knows what's going on. They're transparent. Transparency is part of their currency. It's as important as gold. Transparency helps them develop investments. It helps the leaders communicate with the people. The people communicate with the leaders. The whole city communicate with the rest of the world to tell their story. You know, I know some of you are out there telling Bindong's story. I'm out there, I'm your ambassador. I tell your story all the time because I think it's important for the world to know about you. So they do communicate very well. And this is, this is the cycle of communication. You have the leaders, you have the communications the network, the basic communications system. You have the media to get out the message 
And then you have an amplified citizen, a citizen who you've made big because they feel now like they're being communicated to by their government. They feel like they've got, they're part of the team. And then you do constant assessment. You continue to look at yourself. Uh, you continue to make sure that like a golfer, you keep practicing, you keep practicing until you get perfect. That's the second thing. The third thing is that they don't lose focus. You know, it's very easy today to, um, you know, I'm a boss, right? I'm, I'm the boss. Uh, you know, I can walk into a, an office, and this is not you, Matt, of course, but I walk into an office and you ask a worker, what do they, what do, they do? What is, why are they here? They sit at their desk, they're at their computer, and you say, why are you here? And if they say to you, oh, I'm here to answer my email. I'm here to clean out the supply closet. You say, no, you're not. You're here to make cities better around the world, right? So you can't lose focus on your mission, even though your work gets tedious, even though you're busy. You must remember all the time, and it's up to the leader to tell you why you're here, what the mission is, to keep repeating that mission. And what's the mission? It's to make cities great, to make your city an intelligent city, a smart city. And that's what you've done here. And you also have to remember that 80% of growth in the modern economy comes from the introduction of new technology. That doesn't mean that you invent a technology company or a product, but that you're always using technology to measure your water supply, to help your garbage get picked up better, to attract business from the outside world for FDI, right? 80% of the wealth that you're gonna create is going to be from that technology introduction. Am I done yet? Let me see. Ah, and the ones who do this obviously end up where you've ended up. They end up seeking the prize, right? So they become a smart 21 community because they now can prove that they're one of the 21 best. Then they go to the top seven, right? They get analyzed further by us. And then if they're really good, they go to the top seven. And then they go and try to become number one. And you can tell that any community that does this has success. And it can be any place. There's Eindhoven after they became number one. Remember that? I was in New York. This is Riverside, California, after they became number one. Riverside had a lot of features that were similar to you. They were the largest agricultural center in the United States in the 19th century. They grew more oranges, had more abundance of agriculture than any other place, but they made the transition to a knowledge economy. Daichung is another uh, city in Taiwan, one of the three intelligent communities we've had. Toronto in Canada was another. And they all followed the same program. Their leaders all did those three things. Taiwan has um, been a top seven 17 times, for example. Okay, the best examples are in the ICF. You heard from Dublin, Ohio today. They are now the center of a project called Intelligent Ohio. The work that they're doing now is allowing them to invite other cities from the state of Ohio to come to Dublin, Ohio to learn the ICF method. And as a result, the entire economy of the state of Ohio continues to improve because they're learning in that one intelligent community at the ICF Institute. ICF has an institute, several institutes, and one of them is in Ohio. Uh, Eindhoven um, absorbed, they took in 36% of all private research and development funding. So they were always assessing themselves. Remember, constant reassessment. They were looking at R&D on, on a consistent basis and investing in it. And that was one of the reasons for their success. Espo Finland, who you are going to hear from shortly today, has 520,000 citizens. But last year they reached out, remember I talked about communication? They reached out to their citizens 37 million times. 
to answer problems, to communicate with them. 37 million times for 520,000 people. That's a city that's staying in touch and communicating well with their citizens. And they became intelligent community of the year. And they're using artificial intelligence to do a lot of this. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that hopefully today. Sunshine Coast Australia is another place. They are not just a place to go and, and do what I like to do, surf in the ocean. Uh, they're doing much, much more in the IT area. They've balanced their economy. And you'll hear from them shortly. ICF Taiwan, we have an ICF organization in Taiwan and they do the same thing that's being done in Ohio. They've got, um, I believe it's, I think Maggie said, Maggie Chow this morning said 22 cities in Taiwan now that the president says makes Taiwan an intelligent nation. They don't just want their cities to be intelligent cities. They want their whole country to be intelligent because there's only 23 million people there and they don't have friends um, next door like we do in America. Like, they know that they have to perform at a very high level in order to say, stay viable economically and socially. And I think you're a great example. I really include Bindong as one of the cities today that is the best example. Uh, you are reinventing the idea of the industrial park. You're turning industrial parks into intelligent communities. And you may think that that is something that's done everywhere in the world, but you should be very proud because you're the leader. You're one of the leaders. It's not being done everywhere in the world. People are just building industrial parks and, and sticking the manufacturing out there. You guys are, Bindong is building an entire ecosystem. That's very hard work. That's a very difficult things to do. And yet you've done it. So you're a good example. So um, what I have to say, I, I think I can say this. One of our analysts who, who judges the Smart 21 uh, said to me, um, I think Bindong um, never loses focus. Can you tell me if that's true when you go there? Um, so I think that's a, a very high compliment. Look, I think at the end of the day, technology is, is important. Technology has always been important. Even people who lived in caves, you know, figured out a way to rub two rocks together to make fire. That was technology. Technology is very important. We, we need it. We're going to continue to improve it. And we're going to use it like the tool that it is. But at the end of the day, the smart city, like the human being, has to evolve into a higher life form, right? The city has to evolve into a higher life form where people really, really live fully, live in peace, live in prosperity. We think that's when you use intelligent community ideas. We think that's the final result. And so with that, I'm going to leave you, but I hope you've taken away at least one or two good ideas and that the students especially understand what your city is doing here, how important it is, and that when you get into a position of leadership, you will take what was left to you and continue to build it. So I wanna thank my hosts for allowing me to share these ideas with you. And um, I'm around if you have any questions. So thank you and we'll see you soon.